So this is my last question. Yes, sir. Uh, most of our students are high school age. What is one thing you would tell your high school self if you could do that? If you could do that. Oh wow! One thing I could tell yeah. my high school self. Yeah, if you were in high school, you say I could tell um, high school Sarah. Make here's this. high school Sarah. Um, kind of two things, okay. but they tie in together, and that is. As long as I am okay with God, it does not matter one bit what anybody else thinks. Mm. And that is a hard thing. I didn't learn that until I was like past 30. I'm not going to say how far past 30 I am because it's none of y'all's business. But the other thing, and I remember figuring this out in my 20s, and that is you do not need new friends everywhere you go. What you need are good friends. Mm. And you keep those good friends. So when you have a good friend, someone who is living with a heart after Jesus, someone who encourages you, someone who, and I'm not talking about just what you get from them either, but when you have a good friend, someone who is a good person in your life, not a codependent relationship, not a draining relationship, where you both build each other up, you keep that person. And you stay loyal to that person and you keep investing in that friendship because the friendships that I treasure now are the ones that began being built and have continued being trustworthy since I was you guys' age. Wow, awesome. I don't need new friends everywhere I go. When I go new places and I find a new friend that is an amazing person, that is a bonus. Mm. But if you spend your life trying to connect and, and make yourself liked, by new people everywhere you go, you will spend your, your whole life living for the approval of people who are not going to stick around, wow. and that is not worth it. Wow. So that's what I would tell 16-year-old me, and I would save myself a few years of trying to be smaller and stupider and more socially acceptable mm. by trying to just fit in with other people who weren't my people in the first place. That's good. That's good. So... I had an opportunity to hear you, and I really want our students to hear this. And I really, um, guys, I really want you all to lock in, because this is going to be some really good stuff. So, Sarah, thank you so much for being You're here. You're welcome. Thank you, Kamon, for the opportunity to come. So, I have lived in this town for seven years, and I have never been to this school. Is that pathetic, or? I don't know. I never got, well, I know the school is new. I know, but, you know, like, I've never, I've never come over here, and, and I'm excited to be here. That's my whole point. I am excited to be here with you guys this morning. So I am going to need you to stick with me because I'm going to move fast, all right? You guys good with that? Yes. And I like that y'all are so chatty this morning because I need you to talk back to me. I just need you to talk back to me about what I'm talking about and not everything else. Can we do that? Oh, well, now nobody wants to say anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things. First, I'm going to need a helper partway through. I'm assuming, well, I need somebody with a cell phone. I got you right now. Oh, you got me. Okay. Well, okay. A couple, no, I need you to you do something on your cell phone for me. So if you guys have phones, which you probably are not supposed to have, so all y'all just got busted. No, I'm kidding. Um, if you guys have phones, when I get to that point, I'm going to need you to, to like look some, some stuff up online for me really fast, if you can do that. Okay? You got me? All right, now I need your help. We're going to play a game, and it is called Good Relationship, Bad Relationship. You tell me what's what, okay? To women. Okay, kids. A man who truly loves you will never let you go no matter how hard the situation is. Good relationship, bad relationship? Good. Good, okay. All right, to men. A woman who truly loves you will be angry at you for so many things, but she's never going to leave you. Good relationship or bad relationship? Okay, wait a second. That one was mixed. How many of you say good relationship? Okay, and how many of you say bad relationship? Well, there's a whole bunch of you that are abstaining from this vote, and that's not acceptable. So... We're going to do this. Hey, 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 come back. Come back around. Come back around. We got more to, we got more to talk about. Who else? Hey, who says good relationship? For this, like the, the one, the, the, a woman who truly loves you might be angry at you for so many things, but she's never going to leave you. Good or bad? Okay. Bad relationship. Who says bad relationship? A couple of you. All right. All right. Next one. Next one. Where? There we go. If you're my boyfriend, then there is absolutely no need to get jealous because I'm probably obsessed with you. Yes. Is that a good relationship? No. I can't tell. I can't tell. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do this like a vote because I can't tell. It's just noise.
voice. But I like that you're talking. So good relationship. Thumbs up. Thumbs down. Okay. Okay. Let's see what else. Missing you is my hobby. Caring for you is my job. Making you happy is my duty. Loving you is my life. Good relationship? Yes? Bad relationship? No? No? We got a split kind of audience again? Okay, come on. Okay, here's a text message. How about this text message? Shh, I'm going to read this. I seriously cannot stop thinking about you. You cloud my thoughts. You, I'm always thinking about you, and it just makes me smile. You are gorgeous. Perfect personality. You have beautiful eyes. Your smile. Oh, my goodness. Your smile. It just makes my heart melt. Seriously, you are the cutest. I apologize if this freaks you out or weirds you out in any way. I just want you to know, sorry, if this at all sounds like I'm trying to rush you. Kisses. Good? Okay, you two, you're right here. You're like, you're like, you're trying to say something. What, what do you think? Yes? No? Yes! You! Hey! Shh! Shh! Break it down. No? No? Why not? Okay, she sounds like she's obsessed with him. Okay, somebody over here. You. You were saying yes, it's good. Tell me why. He's just telling you what he likes and it's not creepy. Okay, no worries. When a guy cries, good relationship, bad relationship. Okay, everybody thumbs up or thumbs down. When a guy cries at the thought of losing you, he truly loves you. I see all my boys saying kind of yes. Yeah. Girls, what do you think? Yes? Okay. How about this one? I can honestly say, hey, hey, shh. Thumbs up or thumbs down. I can honestly say you are on my mind 24-7. Yes? Good? Yes? No? Do you not want to be on his mind? What? How about this one? Y'all are probably too young for this movie. Is this dating me? This is like when we were young. Jerry Maguire? You? Complete me. And she's like, you had me in hello. Friend zone. Burn. Burn. Okay. Be with someone. How about this one? Be with someone who won't stay mad at you, who can't stand not talking to you, and who's afraid of losing you. Good? Yeah? Good? Bad? Good? Bad? All right. All right. Okay, next one. All these, all these things right here. Not one of these is a good relationship, you guys. No. No. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm going to wait until you're ready to listen. A man who truly loves you knows that you belong to God, not him. And he is not going to stand in the way of what God calls you to do or where God tells you to go. He is not going to prevent you from leaving him like you are his plaything or possession. A woman who truly loves you may be angry at you for so many things, but will never leave you. Well, I tell you what, if you keep doing things that sinfully make her angry, she should leave you. Here we go. Girls, if a guy insists on continuing in sin, whatever that is, and is not repentant, you should leave him. Young men, same goes for you. If a girl insists on living a life that is not glorifying to God and is doing things that are not Godly, I'm talking about sinful things, lying, cheating, deceiving, these things. You do not stay out of loyalty to the relationship. If you are my boyfriend, there's no need to get jealous because I'm probably obsessed with you. Boys, run. <laughs> She's crazy. <laughs> Missing you is my hobby. Caring for you is my job. No, it's not. Making you happy is my duty. That's your own job between you and God. Loving you is my life. 
Loving God should come first. Everyone else comes out of the love God develops within us for him first. This? He's going to jail someday for an episode of Criminal Minds. I don't care who it is. She is. She's going to jail. He is. I don't care if that's a guy or a girl. When a guy cries at the thought of losing you, he truly loves you. Let me tell you something, young ladies. Tears are not love. Loss does not equate love. Fear of loss does not equal emotional attachment in a healthy way. Never treat those as an indicator of real love. If he says this, run away. Because if it's true, it's bad. And if it's not, he's a liar. Wait, this? If you are on, so if when someone says, you are honestly on my mind, on my mind, 24-7, that's, that's cute. <laughs> If someone says, you are on my mind 24-7, they have no life, and God is not the center of their world. If you are in a healthy relationship, you are not. A healthy relationship does not prevent you from living a full and healthy life with everything else God has called you to do. Okay, hey, calm down. Calm down. Come back to me here. So what I said was, if someone says this to you, run away because it's bad. And if they, I mean, if they say it to you and it's true, run away because it's bad. If they say it to you and it's not true, run away because they're lying. This, nobody needs to complete you. You are a whole person. You may be already a broken person, and that's okay because that happens in the world we live in. But God is the one who is healing, and God is the one who does the completing, not someone else. Not another human. Be with someone who won't stay mad at you, can't stand not talking to you, and is afraid of losing you. That is a codependent person with no boundaries. That's someone who doesn't know who they are. And you get to pull all their strings. Now, let's talk about this. You tell me, what is abuse? Hitting. 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 Does everyone agree that hitting is abuse? Okay. Now, I want hands. I want hands. We got a lot to get through still. You. What is abuse? What she said? Hitting. Yeah, you. Yes, you had your hand up. I was agreeing to it. Oh, you were agreeing to it. Okay. Abuse is an improper treatment of another it's my son, you guys. My son, all grown up, right here in this room. My kid would totally do that. All right. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. I want to know what you think abuse is. More than just hitting. More than just hitting. Yes. Verbal abuse. So, what does verbal abuse look like? Shh. Right now I'm feeling a little verbally abused, you guys. Come on. Shh. Just kidding. Yes. Talking negatively about someone's thoughts or opinions. That's good. Yes. I can't hear you, so they can't either. Cursing at somebody. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Causing what? Constantly putting people down. Can you guys bring it down just a little bit more, please, so that I can hear those who are actually, who's, who are responding. Thank you. So, what? Is abuse just hitting? No. no. But by the definition of abuse, have any of you ever in your life put someone down? Yes. Have any of you ever in your life spoken negatively about someone else? By the behavior. Okay, here. This is important. This is important. Now, I'm going to give you some information, and I'm going to move fast 
so that your teachers don't get mad at me because I got like less than 10 minutes and I got a lot to cover that I really, really want you to walk away from. I don't want you to just walk away thinking those were some crappy memes. I want you to, to have some tools to walk away from this with, okay? So, by the behavioral definition of abuse, we are all abusers. Let that sink in. Every single one of us is capable of abusing someone else. But would you agree with me that that kind of behavior is wrong? Yes. No? Well, we have one contrarian in the room. Would you agree with me that it is unacceptable to negatively talk about another person? Yes. Would you agree with me that it is unacceptable to go around hitting people? Yes. Would you agree with me that these types of behavior are wrong? So if we are all abusive at times, what is the difference between being a sinner who screws up sometimes and being an abuser? What's the difference? There is a difference. Yes. Shh. I'd say us as being a sinner Yes, you do bad things, but you try not to make it your lifestyle. And being an abuser, someone who makes those bad things their lifestyle. Yes. Good. Excellent answer. I'm going to repeat it for everybody. Being, an, being a sinner is someone who occasionally does bad things but does not make it their lifestyle. Being an abuser is someone who makes those behavior patterns your lifestyle. You took my next point. Good job. So... Abuse is the improper treatment of another when one misuses their natural powers, privileges, or advantages. An abuser is someone who mistreats another in speech or behavior, someone who deceives, uses rudeness of language, ill treatment, or violence toward another person. And domestic abuse is defined as a systematic pattern of behaviors in a relationship that are used to gain and maintain power over the other person. So here's the thing. Abuse is the pattern, the system, the structure. Abuse is when the relationship or the interaction is made up of those behavior patterns. Now, the system is where you treat somebody bad, you get to treat somebody bad, and they have to stick with you anyway. Do you see some of that in those memes? Doesn't matter what you do, she's gonna stick with you anyway. Doesn't matter what she does, he's never gonna leave you. That is an abusive structure system. Where you get to be rotten to someone else and they can't leave. That's abuse. Now, this, your culture, your music, your television, your shows, your movies, they teach you to find and accept toxic relationships. Your social media, your favorite songs, your radio stations, your playlists, the stuff you watch, the video games you play, all condition you to accept or perpetrate abuse. Our world does not go around teaching us what is safe and loving. Our world does not teach you to value respect and kindness and wholeness. Our world teaches you to find abuse and be okay with it until it's too late. And that's where I come in. Because I'm not just a leadership development coach, that's what I advertise. I am also an abuse recovery coach. I'm a survivor of abuse. I was in an abusive marriage. I was a pastor's wife. And now what I do is help other people recover from abusive relationships. But what I also want to do is help young people like you not get into them in the first place. And the only way that you can avoid getting into abusive relationships in the first place is if you learn to see abuse for what it is instead of being conditioned to accept it regardless. Because, you see guys, some of you in this room, some of your future wives are gonna be my clients. Girls, some of you, no, that is not a challenge, that is a fact, young man. Now 
Now listen, girls, some of you, not quite old enough to get married yet, but give it five years, give it seven years, and I will be helping some of you escape from your husbands. Did you hear what I just said? Hey, you guys. I will be helping some of the young women in this room escape from your husband someday. Or someone like me. Because as an abuse recovery coach, when I get involved is often when it has gotten so bad, you need extraction. And you don't know how to get safe. You don't know who you can trust. You have been systematically disassembled piece by piece in your heart and your mind and your soul until you don't know who you are anymore or where to go or how to keep your children safe. And that's where I come in. But abuse is a human problem. I'm not here to point fingers at the guys or point fingers at the girls. Abuse is not a male problem or a female problem. Abuse is a sin problem. And sin affects humans. The defining point of abuse is when the abuser starts to exercise power over the victim in a way that causes harm to the victim and creates a privileged status for the abuser. Now this is how you get into that system and this is what I want you to walk away from. Stick with me here. This is the relationship progression of abuse and this is what I want you to listen to closely. Stage one, it's perfect. Charming, smooth. Awesome, it's generous, and all that amazing goodness comes with strings attached, baby. I do this, how come you don't do this back for me? You don't need to do that, I'll do it for you. And that creates a sense of dependence and reliance. Now, if I'm an abuser, I want to make this as good as possible for you so that you want what I've got. As long as I make you dependent on the good stuff, you will do whatever it takes to get the good stuff to come back when it gets bad. You won't leave me. You'll work hard to get it back to good. That brings you to stage two, very physically affectionate. Now this creates two things. One, false intimacy. Two, isolation. You're like, hey, wait a second, hold the phone. If we're getting more physically affectionate, how does that create isolation? Good question. See, physical affection gives the illusion of emotional connection. An abusive person doesn't do real emotions. They don't have true emotions to show you, except maybe anger later on. But physical affection can be given for very different reasons. So you get trapped, especially girls, you get trapped into thinking it's one thing when it's another thing. And this, I'm going to step on some toes. This is why the pornification of our society is such a problem. Because it creates an illusion that physical affection is not about emotional connection. It is about using you for their gratification. It creates false intimacy. Now girls, if you wanna make sure you're not getting into an abusive relationship, here's a secret. Who wants my secret? Don't let him touch you. You heard me. <laughs> girls, if you want to make sure that you are getting a genuine emotional connection with someone who actually cares about you and isn't just there to use you, don't let him touch you. If you can sustain, that was a delayed reaction. If he can sustain a genuine emotional connection long term without the perks of your body, you have a much higher likelihood of it lasting and being good. Amen. Now that is still not a guarantee. And there is one substitute for physical affection 
that happens very often in deeply religious communities. Because you know, hey, in Christian schools, you're not supposed to be doing that stuff anyway, right? And by the way, that's where isolation comes in because the more physical affection you are hiding from the people who know better and are genuinely caring for you, the more isolated you are from those who could intervene or see danger signs or help you understand the cliff that you are about to nosedive from the top of that you don't see yet. So the more you hide your relationship away, the more isolated you are from real love and help. Someone who wants to do things with you that you need to hide is not bringing you closer to Jesus. If the nature of your relationship requires deception, it is toxic. Did you hear me? If the nature of your relationship requires you to lie, cheat, hide, deceive, it is already an abusive relationship. Because you can't be honest. And an, and a healthy relationship comes with honesty, openness, transparency, vulnerability, respect, wholeness, and freedom. If those are not a core part of your relationship, it is already abusive. Premature physical affection creates a bond that you want more of. And that's how God made it. That's not a bad thing. But... You want it so badly, you're dependent on getting it, and the physical affection comes along with ownership. You can see this in people's, the way they touch each other. I own you. Small example, Joe Biden. That's all I need to say. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go check Twitter. Not right now. Don't check Twitter right now. Hyper-spirituality can become a replacement for the false intimacy of physical affection in an environment where, are you guys still tracking with me? So, in a, in a really religious environment where you're not supposed to be sexually active, if you are actually abiding by that, that can be replaced and you can still end up with an abusive person because of hyper-spirituality. So if someone is so good because of all the spiritual things they say, he must love me, she must love me because they're virtue signaling all the time. You know what virtue signaling is? Virtue signaling is making sure I do good godly things so everybody knows how awesome I am. Everybody know anybody like that? Yeah. We've all been to church at least once, right? So we've all seen somebody like that. Virtue signaling does not mean that that person is a healthy, safe person. It just means they like making sure other people think well of them. That's all it means. There's a huge, healthy serving of pride. That's all it means. So, instead of saying he must love me because he's so good and so spiritual, or he must love me because he is so affectionate in how he touches me, do this instead. How does she treat people who have nothing to give her? What is he like when it's quiet? How do they handle it when someone makes them angry? What do they do when they are not in control of things? Stop listening to words, you guys, and look at what people do. You can believe some of what they say and you can believe everything they do. So if he says he's sorry and he keeps on cheating, believe the actions. If she says she didn't mean to and then she lies again and again, believe the actions. Words mean nothing when it comes to assessing character. Anybody can have pretty words. So, stage three, withdrawal. And this, how many of you have been in a dating relationship at some point? Hello, question for the audience. How many of you have been in a dating relationship at some point? Yes, you know that point where it shifts from, this is awesome, I love this, it's going to last forever, to, oh my goodness, I don't know what's wrong. You guys never got to that point. Well, sweetie, you got a lot of life left to live. That's okay. But this is where stage three withdrawal, come on, shh, I'm almost done. Stage three withdrawal is, stage three, this is where you feel insecurity and the expectations start to shift 
And all of a sudden, that stuff where it was so awesome, and you needed it, and you wanted it, and you can't live without it, all of a sudden you're like, wait, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And then you're asking yourself, and then you start doing the things that it took to get that awesome, awesome generosity and love bombing is what we call it back. The message you learned in that situation, or you will learn if you haven't yet, is that the other person is saying, you can keep me if you be good. Did you hear me? Your behavior manages my feelings. And that is a lie because you are responsible for your behavior and your feelings and he or she is responsible for his behavior and his feelings and you are not to manage or control or be responsible for each other's feelings. Subtly, they're blaming you for the success of the relationship. And eventually, you know, hey, two people can play that game too. It isn't always just one-sided. But eventually, if two people are playing that game, at some point, the needier one will be willing to sacrifice their identity to keep the relationship. And when you're done, you've given up a piece of yourself. There are two metaphors that go with this. One is, this is war. Ever heard songs about love being about war? Yep, it's a battlefield. I mean, that was a good song, right? Except that's all about conquering. Somebody wins, so somebody loses. And that is not love. The other one is, it's a transaction. You give me this, I give you that. That's what you do when you go shopping. That is not a healthy relationship. So, stage four, and that is where it starts to get manipulation and threatening. So first, you've got it where it's perfect. Second, you get really involved and you're dependent on it. It's like crack to your soul. And then there's the withdrawal and you're insecure and you don't know what's going on and you'll do anything to get it back to where it was good. And then comes the manipulation ship. It's not a relationship anymore. It's a manipulation ship. It's a threatening, you gotta do this or I won't. And at this point, this is where the whole idea, that's your truth, this is mine, that is toxic. There are no multiple sets of truth. There is reality and there is perception. And there may be his perception and her perception, but there is still reality. But in an abusive relationship, you begin to talk with the voice of the other person and the whole point is for you to, to begin accepting their perception and denying what you know to be reality. Some of you have had this happen to you at home. This doesn't just apply to dating. Some of you have had this happen to you every day of your life in childhood with an abusive parent or abusive siblings or abusive friends. It is not exclusively related to romantic encounters. And all of it is abusive. And stage five, well, that's cruelty. That's where you're actually scared. And this, stage five, that right there, that's where most people think abuse starts, when you get hit. But abuse started way back up here when you thought you fell in love. And then it continued, and it got more and more, so that by the time you got all the way down here, you were conditioned to accept all of it, and you had no idea. And you're making excuses for him or her. And culture tells you, this is how to do it. Everything around you says this is the way to do relationships, and they're lying. A whole relationship, a godly relationship, offers both freedom and the absence of fear. Perfect love, what? Perfect love casts out fear. God's kind of love does not include fear. It is safe. It is trusting. It is honest. And where there is fear, there is no love. Where there is not freedom for you to be you as God created you to be. And I don't mean freedom for you to be an idiot or to act a fool. I mean freedom for you to live in the identity that God has given you. Where there is no freedom for you to be you as God has created you to be, there is no love. 
because a genuine, healthy relationship in your family, in your dating life, in your future family, even in your workplace, has both freedom and love. So as you guys leave today, thank you for engaging, for talking, for sharing, for interacting back and forth. I appreciate it greatly. And if you walk away with one thing, it is that I want you to know that if there is fear, it is not love. And Jesus wants to give you love. I love this girl. I've known her for a while.